there is a very special place far away in the northeast corner of Alaska. It's commonly referred to as Anwar, but its full name paints a more truthful picture of its real value, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It is one of the unique lands in America that we have set aside to preserve a piece of our natural heritage. But this land is threatened. Are you in support of the current legislation which would preserve the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, also known as ANWR? Uh, number one, I support uh, drilling in ANWR. The Arctic Refuge is believed to be America's best prospect for a large find of oil. I think one of the biggest threat to our culture would be development of any kind. We really consider the Arctic Refuge as an international treasure, and there is no way that we can ever let oil development take and experiment with this place. I came on this trip because I wanted to learn more about the issue. I wanted to learn the truth about both sides. Our concern over the future of our nation's last wildlands took us to the northernmost edge of our continent. To Gwich'in Village in the Arctic, to the oil fields of Prudhoe Bay. And into the heart of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. In the summer of 1996, these five teenagers found themselves in Alaska on a quest to find out if America's thirst for oil may be going too far. Their story begins in Colorado, back in the summer of 95. It was a very special gathering of young people from around the world. The Youth Environmental Summit of 1995 will truly be a global summit. These teenagers brought together more than 300 of their peers from around the world to learn about things like human rights, rainforest destruction, endangered species, and other global problems. But out of all these issues, there was one that really caught their attention. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is the largest wildlife refuge in the United States. Lenny Combe described the land in the northeast corner of Alaska that has been compared to the Serengeti in Africa. It's the most incredible wilderness I've ever seen. It's pure wilderness. He explained how the massive porcupine caribou herd returns to the coastal plain of the refuge every year, as they have for thousands of years during a critical time in their life cycle. They use the coastal plain as their nursery and how biologists consider the coastal plain to be the center of life in the refuge. It is the biological heart of this whole ecosystem. And how the same coastal plain has caught the attention of the oil industry. Because there are suspected deposits of gas and oil there. Then he went on to explain how the Gwich'in natives survive on the caribou herd as they have for thousands of years. And these folks are really concerned about this issue. A Gwich'in woman came down from the Arctic to ask for help in their struggle against the proposed oil development. This development would mean the end of my people and our existence that we have had since time immemorial. It is one of the hardest fought environmental battles in American history. The grassroots, people like Lenny and the Gwich'in fighting the oil industry. It is a David and Goliath sort of battle that will seal the fate of one of America's last great wilderness areas. And the summit crowd was about to step into the middle of it. How many of you think that we should protect it forever as wilderness? The summit crowd immediately embraced this cause. We wrote letters to the president and to our senators and U.S. representatives. We held a rally in downtown Denver, and we staged a massive press conference targeting Colorado Senator Ben Campbell. Senator Campbell, when he was running for Senate, he sent out a letter to all the environmentalists in Colorado, and he listed this litany of everything he was going to do for the environment if he were just elected to Senate, and that he would work to protect the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Three weeks ago, he voted against us. We're going to uh, save the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, Senator Campbell made campaign promises to get elected about saving it, and so we're going to pressure him to live up to those campaign promises. We asked Senator Campbell to keep your promise! Yeah. Senator Campbell was elected in 1996. 
plays on the energy, passion, and idealism of our young people without making available all the facts. We're not playing upon anybody's energy, passion, or idealism because we're, we're organizing it ourselves. And that's just a totally ridiculous thing for someone to say. I he said that we were all just getting all riled up about the issue that we really didn't understand, that we didn't have our facts straight. It made me think a lot less. I, I, don't, I don't know what to believe now. But there was one line in the senator's press release that inspired us to do more. He said he hoped we would look beyond the rhetoric for the truth. And thus, the Arctic quest was inspired. After a year of planning and preparation, five teens from the summit headed north to begin their Arctic quest to find the truth for themselves. Fairbanks, we're here. Oh, sweet Alaska, your hills are calling me home. With the sweet smell of springtime, I long to be there. Alaska is where I belong. I've saved up all year long to buy a car. I wanted one so bad, and when I found out about the trip, I decided that I would do that with my money instead and go to Alaska. Jana was really the rave girl. She was always dancing and running about. What can I say? I like to dance. The, oh, the pipeline. Well, I have one time, but if you, if you take a... Eric was very vocal. He wasn't afraid to say what he believed and stand up for what he believed. This is an ode to a mosquito. I hate you. Alex is a future politician, and he was very quick to let you know that he was the, the environmental Republican. I'm a Republican. Monique is like the queen bee of the whole process. She's the leader. Happy birthday to you. Props goes to Monique for being the queen bee who took initiative to organize our trip. All of my life, I had heard people talking about protecting Alaska's wild places, but now I wanted to go to those wild places myself to see exactly what it was that I was fighting for. Our people, as a people, we're not educated and we don't really care enough about things to be educated. Danielle was the Henry David Thoreau of the group. She was always writing something in her journal. A lot of people didn't take it seriously when we shared our ambitions and ideas. Some didn't think we could do it. And then my reaction was, yeah, right. <laughs> then there was Monique's mom, Richie. I just didn't believe it was possible. A group of teenagers just could not put together a trip of that scope. She has lived in Alaska for 30 years and she gave us a place to stay and she's kind of her mother up there. And then there's me the ever-present camera guy. Jeff was uh, the annoying California type who always had the camera in our face. The teens invited me to document their journey and help tell their story. What better place to begin our search for answers than the streets of Fairbanks? The uh, Arctic Refuge. We're about to talk to the people in Fairbanks and uh, find out of their opinions about the uh, possible oil development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Oh, you, you mean pro? Anwar? Yeah, in Anwar. I wanted to know whether people are for or against oil development. Where they have all this oil that's in the ground. Supposedly, yes. Yeah. What I think about it? I really don't know anything about it. Well, I'm for the oil, taking the oil out, yeah. No. People are pretty divided. It's a very emotional issue. This is an area that clearly must be protected. So let's get the oil out. As we talked to more and more people, it seemed like the issue got more complex. You've got to clear my confusion. Oil is a touchy subject, especially in Alaska. Oil revenue is very important for us living here. Yeah. Oil revenues provide roughly 80% of all the revenues in the state treasury and are responsible for a large percentage of the jobs in Alaska. Some Alaskans feel that oil has become a little too important. We are addicted to petroleum. This state is dependent on it to an unholy degree. Alaskans don't pay any income tax or sales tax because the oil companies give so much money to the state. In fact, the oil companies even pay Alaskans to live there. Last year, every man, woman, and child in Alaska received over $1,200 from the Alaska Permanent Fund. The permanent fund was created in the late 1970s by the people of Alaska to create a savings account from the oil wealth that was flowing into Alaska at the time. The permanent fund was started to help keep the Alaskan economy afloat when one day the oil runs out. The fund currently totals about $22 billion, and by the end of the century it's expected to total about $29 billion. 
which is a, a whole lot of money. Production in Alaska's enormous oil fields has gone down since the peak in the early 1980s. So now the search for new oil and new revenue has intensified. Two years, there won't be any land. We uh, also experienced a lot of territorialism up there. I mean, it is draining down low. And we are probably looking at a, as an outsider. I'm an insider. I was born and raised in here. What are we going to exist on? So we had to wonder if the Alaskans in their economy needed the oil and the money, maybe we should develop the refuge. I think the people in the U.S. should keep their hands off and let us develop our own country. After all, we're the ones that are sitting in the cold and we will be sitting in the dark. But that's only one side of the story. We are against it. You can see we're pretty well connected with the land and we don't really like to see that much destroyed. Many people feel that Alaska is the last chance to preserve some of America's wilderness heritage. A hundred years ago, virtually everything west of the Mississippi was mostly wilderness. Um, so it's going fast. Groups like the Northern Alaska Environmental Center are fighting to keep at least some parts of Alaska wild. We work to protect wilderness, wildlife, the clean air and the water that the animals depend on and the people depend on. But it's an uphill battle for conservation groups in Alaska because public support for development of the refuge is strong. The support in Alaska is very strong. It's ranged from the low of the 70% uh, to the high of uh, close to 82%. So why hasn't the refuge been opened? According to Sean McGuire, the answer can be found in history. If you went back to the fights over Yellowstone or Yosemite or the Grand Canyon. In virtually all of those cases, if the locals had been making the decision, they wouldn't be national parks now. They'd be developed. Today, thanks to visionaries in Congress, America has one of the premier park systems in the world. The refuge decision also rests in Congress. And the most vocal development boosters come from Alaska, like Senators Ted Stevens and Frank Murkowski. Representative Don Young. In 1995, this Alaska delegation convinced Congress to approve oil development in the refuge. It was the closest either side had ever come to winning this environmental battle. The fact that they didn't get in there last year to drill is almost a miracle. The entire oil industry was pushing it. They had the state of Alaska, virtually the whole Republican Party, Newt Gingrich, the National Chamber of Commerce. It looked like it was over. But then the grassroots came alive. Letters came into the White House, 40 to 1. Congress was getting swamped with people saying, what are you doing? On December 6, 1995, President Clinton vetoed the bill that would have opened the refuge to development. Clinton saved the day with a veto because there, it was a winner. It was a winning issue. The American people didn't want it. But the Alaska delegation pushes on. In May 1999, Don Young would once again introduce legislation to open the refuge for development. If the Alaska delegation had their way, the refuge wouldn't be a refuge. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is really the Arctic Oil Reserve to be set aside by Congress. Senator Frank Murkowski, Alaska. Not only did we want to learn about the issue, but we also wanted to see some caribou, which in many ways became a symbol of the whole issue itself. I don't think I they should be drilling yeah. because it's going to ruin caribou herd and it ain't going to do any good for the natives. The indigenous peoples of the Arctic are an important part of Alaska's heritage and of the refuge debate as well. Alaska is unique among the rest of the states in that a large portion of Alaskans depend on subsistence, basic hunting and fishing for their livelihoods, and the Gwich'in people are largely dependent on caribou. Our next destination was the Gwich'in village of Old Crow. Everybody has a seatbelt on? Everybody you bet. And this was a chance to go to a subsistence place where they've been living just like they have for thousands of years, using the land and its animals. Old Crow in Canada is home to the Van Tutgwichin, people of the lakes, and their village rests in the ideal spot to intercept the migrating caribou.
At the airport, the Canada Mountie met us there to check our bags to make sure we didn't have any alcohol. Yeah, if anybody ha did bring any booze, um, you can give it to me and there'll be no charges or, or anything like that. Old Crow doesn't have any alcohol at all. It's prohibited. and It's been detrimental to their culture, so they're trying to change that. As we're finding out, the Gwich Inn have learned what is good for them and what is not. The community of Old Crow has a population of about 250 people. The first person we met in Old Crow was Jacqueline Pruner. There is no road access into the community. You have to fly in, or if in the winter months, you can skidoo in or dog sled in. Jacqueline works for the Von Tut Gwich Inn Caribou Coordination Department, created by the community as a way to protect the caribou habitat and the Gwich Inn way of life. Suddenly an alarm sounded and the whole town came alive. Could this be the arrival of the fall migration? It was only a false fire alarm, but we were impressed. It was the closest thing to rush hour traffic that you'd ever see in Old Crow. We came to Old Crow with romanticized expectations of what life would be like in this remote tribal village. So we were surprised to see the Gwich Inn using the same modern conveniences we do. They have clearly struck an ironic balance between modern and ancient ways of life. The next morning, we made our way across town for a very special meeting. We're going to visit the uh, chief of the village. This is Chief Robert Bruce Jr. Hello, hello. 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 In what ways are the caribou uh, a part of your culture? And we live on the food. We, we use the skin for clothing, moccasins, mitts. Well, I guess the caribou is a very big part of our culture. Uh, from the time you're very young, you're taught to appreciate and anticipate when the caribou is coming. Everybody knows, like in the spring and in the fall when it comes, people start telling one another that they've seen bunches here and there. And, you would see like boatloads of people leaving and they would bring their children along and the children are taught to care for the animals. You would have to shoot only bulls and not the cows because the cows give birth and that's our main staple. We eat that year round. It's used for putting out everything the way we live today. And without it, to tell you the truth, I don't think we could survive. Our river guides, Dorothy and Ronald Frost, told us they were taking us to a special place up the Porcupine River. Oh, yeah, take care. Four hours and 40 miles later, we arrived at camp. We learned about how they hunt the caribou and um, the traditions that they've had. Last spring. My boy is 15 years old, and he went across the mountain there and got five caribou. Uh, my son got his first caribou when he was eight, and he had to skin it and cut it up by himself. Try to lift up that pole and get it up there. Camp is where the young ones learn the things they need to know to survive as Gwich Inn. The skills they learn here last a lifetime. As we were about to find out, caribou meat is not only essential to the Gwich Inn diet, it's pretty tasty too. Then the caribou. We all had caribou to eat. Ribs. Uh -uh. Caribou ribs. Thanks to the Porcupine River, Lydia's camp. Oh, delicious. It's like, I don't know how to describe it, actually. Tastes like caribou. Yeah. Best ribs I've ever had before in my life. Mm. You, need it on it. <laughs> you too, Eric, right? <laughs> it was really funny because two of the vegetarians of the group were pretty much consuming all the caribou ribs that were there. I don't think I've ever eaten ribs before. Mm. I did it out of respect to, to the Gwich'in culture. Once I did try the caribou, I did think it was pretty good. And the caribou. Uh, <laughs> I'm busy, Jeff. Leave me alone. That's a meat vegetarian. Whatever your reasons for being vegetarian are, the fact is that the meat that's harvested down here and grown down here for mass consumption is a lot different than meat that's, that's hunted and used for a way of life. In the subsistence way of life, all nature's offerings find a use and nothing goes to waste. Claire Murphy and Jane High, Gold Rush Women.
We left the camp around 3 o'clock the next morning with a new perspective on how closely these people are tied to the caribou. If the caribou is uh, destroyed by oil and gas up in their breeding grounds, and they find enough oil and gas there, they would take it out. And that's what the Americans would use in their houses and their cars and so on. Meanwhile, we're here. We're always been here for thousands of years, depending on that caribou herd. And if it disappear, what's going to happen is that you'll see more of us on the welfare line. Once that happens, what's going to happen to us? Our culture is going to die. That's one of our top priority at this point is to try to stop that development. Are oil companies or anybody promising you money or jobs or anything? Oh, yeah. Definitely, yes. They all kinds of offers. There'll be all kinds of jobs. They'll train your people. Yeah. And to me, I don't like that because it's just the way they get you to, so they get on the land to do all this exploring and then they give you money, your people jobs, give them money and then as soon as they finish and they're just going to leave and then what the people going to have left. But when the jobs are gone, what else can be found? When the cash is gone, he's on. Other nations of indigenous peoples in the Arctic have come to embrace oil development, but only after a long fight. In the 1970s, the Inupiat Eskimos of the North Slope finally caved in to immense pressures after fighting development for many years. A one-time mayor from the village of Kaktovik said they got burned out after hundreds of meetings arguing against development. Weary of fighting a losing battle, they surrendered to the world of the bottom line and have since profited enormously from oil development on their lands. In the last 20 years, we have airports, police protection, fire protection, health clinics, airports, roads, street lights. The things that people take for granted every day, we enjoy those things now. Of course, they're supporting further oil development because they're going to get further money off of it. The Inupiat are in the game for good, pushing for new developments to support their contemporary lifestyles. Once you start something, you don't turn the page back. You can't turn the page back in history, so you look for more oil. There will be no development here. The Gwich'in, on the other hand, prefer not to turn that page forward. Their nation of nearly 8,000 has taken a united stand against development in the refuge, and consequently, they face heavy criticism from people in our world. Wayne Anthony Ross, an Anchorage attorney, said, this whole idea of subsistence is in itself a step back into the 19th century. What Native leaders should be talking about is developing their land, making use of it so people will not have to live in economies where there are no grocery stores. Who are they to say whose standards is right or wrong? I mean, yeah, what is who's, of life? who's to set the standard of living? Yeah, you know, to say, I'm better too. than, I live better that's than you. <laughs> the folks in Old Crow, you know, you should ask them if they were getting annual payments, would they feel differently? I think that might change their mi your minds a little no. bit. No. You can't no. eat money. Money's not, <laughs> not going to no. We need the caribou for a future for the youth, young. Yes. They got to see caribou. They got to taste caribou. That's what it's all about. Their bank account, their industry, is their traditional way of life in the caribou herd. Asking the Gwich'in to live in a cash-based economy is, is just purely ridiculous. It'd be like asking us to live off the land again. People, people wouldn't do it. They wouldn't even know what to do. It is a big temptation. I mean, if you're offered a job for $100,000 a year versus living in a community where there's high unemployment and living on SA for $410 a month, I mean, what would you take? So we have to teach our children and teach the young to be strong and to say no, that no, we can do it on our own. As we walked around town, we were surprised to see how much technology the community had. They decided long ago that they wanted no permanent roads into the village from the outside. Instead, they used satellite technology to stay connected to the outside world without getting too close. We don't just concentrate just on our own little community. Like, we know what's going on out there. We pay attention because whatever is happening out in the rest of the world is either directly or indirectly affecting us. The Gwich Inn know that their fate lies in the hands of the U.S. government and ultimately the American people. This is why they have taken their battle into the political arena. Since the early 1980s, the Gwich Inn have been touring the lower 48, sharing their cause with the U.S. Congress and the American people. We are being deprived of our basic human right 
to live as we always have and be who we are. The efforts of the Gwich'in are a big reason the refuge is still protected. And as long as it stays that way, they can keep on living the only way they know. The land was all green and just beautiful there. And we were able to hike up to Crow Mountain. I think it was a sacred place for the elders. Maybe you gain more insight being up there and being on top of everything to be able to overlook it all. The culture is about using the land in a way that doesn't harm it, surviving off the caribou. We're taught to take care of it. If we can't take care of our land, it's not gonna take care of us. I mean, look around you, you see the rest of the world. For over the past 200 years, we in the lower 48 have spent millions and millions of dollars trying to clean up the lands that we've polluted. The Gwich'in don't want to make the same mistakes that we made. We still can drink that water. We go up the river, we can drink it. There's no, not polluted. That's why we're so protective about it. So it really makes you think about how global we are and how united this world is in everything we do. The winds are always blowing and the water's always flowing and we affect each other. The message is there. Please don't touch that environment. I'll be back to harass you some more. Get in the car, let's go. How are you feeling here? Pretty crowded. Um, pretty I'm crowded. gonna be nice tired already. The Dalton Highway is the northernmost highway in the U.S. Nearly 500 miles of dirt, gravel, and mud. Services are few and far between. Not the kind of place you want to break down. All right, find the jack. Okay, which side is it on? It took a while to figure out where the tire was. What do they call the access cover? We need this. Then how to get it out was another problem. What are we doing, you guys? We're taking apart the van. <laughs> the tire can be slid rearward. Everything on this. Hey, stop. You're putting it on backwards? Are we? Yes. Okay. Who's got the lugs? Finally, we are on our way to Prudhoe Bay, the largest operating oil fields in North America. Hey, look, it's the pipeline. With a price tag of over $8 billion, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was the largest private construction project in U.S. history. In only three years, over 70,000 workers constructed this 800-mile, four-foot diameter steel tube, which crosses three mountain ranges and 800 rivers and streams. Many consider the pipeline a technological marvel, a heroic symbol of human ingenuity overcoming the harsh conditions of the Arctic. But others see it as a scar on the landscape. The wilderness of Alaska has its heroes too. Bob Marshall was one of the first to see a need to protect the wildlands of Alaska from the encroachment of civilization. In 1935, he founded the Wilderness Society. Marshall wanted to protect all lands north of the Yukon River. This never happened, but it did inspire two Alaskans, the husband and wife team of Drs. Olus and Margaret Meary. They led the successful drive to protect the northeast corner of Alaska, which was proclaimed the Arctic Wildlife Range in 1960 under the Eisenhower administration. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter doubled the size of the range and upgraded the status to that of a refuge, which it still holds today. This protected the land as a permanent wilderness. But when the new borders were drawn, a special provision known as Section 1002 called for a comprehensive study of the coastal plain resources, including its oil and gas potential. In this act, Congress reserved for itself the authority to reassess the protected status of the 1002 lands in the future. Today, the future is here, and while some in Congress want to open the land for development, Senator William Roth and Representative Bruce Vento are working to protect it. What I've done is to pick up the work of others to designate uh, this, uh, this key parcel as wilderness and to keep it in its natural state forever, to prevent mining, to prevent the development and exploration, further exploration of oil there. 
wilderness bills introduced by Roth and Vento have gained unprecedented support in both houses of Congress. And if they succeed, they may become the next wilderness heroes. When you pump your gas, you don't really think of, man, am I killing Anwar and Caribou, or what am I doing? I'm just filling up the gas tank. Consumption of oil worldwide has doubled every decade since 1950, which means we gotta find billions of barrels worth of new deposits to keep on living the way we do. Americans have come to see oil as a birthright, and changes don't come easy. Oil's just one of those evils. No matter what our beliefs, we can't escape our dependence on it. But that is also what we seek to change. We were driving along and all of a sudden we saw these caribou and we all started shouting. And we jumped out of the car and we got up to them. There was one that was really curious in us. And he just would keep on looking at us and like pretend to eat grass and come closer and closer. He was just really curious. Guy. And a truck came by and scared him away. We were 25 miles away from Prudhoe Bay, from Dead Horse. We looked up straight up the hall road and we saw this layer of smog. And we we're like, whoa, what is that? Oil production on the North Slope emits enormous amounts of air pollution, as much as a city the size of Chicago or Washington, D.C. Scientists worldwide agree that our growing dependence on fossil fuels poses a major threat to our global climate. And it's not just global warming that's a concern. Our dependence on oil is responsible for most of the air pollution in our major cities. The reasons to look for alternatives to petroleum are pretty obvious. Before we got down to business in Peru Bay, we had something else very important to take care of. Our initiation into the polar bear club. We are about to uh, Park Go in the uh, Arctic Ocean. The requirement of joining the Arctic Polar Bear Club is that you have to fully submerge yourself in freezing cold water. Oh my God! We did it twice. In, oh. We're twice as stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and then our experience began at Prudhoe Bay. It's kind of ironic that we're going, driving through all this beautiful, pristine wilderness, and what you come to at the end is just this... Endless expanse of pipes and buildings. All these buildings and roads and, and roads. factories. It's just so spread out. 350 square miles. It's made such a major miles. impact on the environment. The Crew base industrial hell. area. Smells like the hell Factories. factories. Uh, I've never seen more disgusting place in the world than Dead Horse. Gary and Anna comes close, but... And this is mile zero. This is the beginning of it all. Prudhoe Bay pumps out nearly 10% of America's total oil needs, averaging over 1 million barrels per day, making this America's largest and most productive oil field. And this is the beginning uh, where all the oil starts its trip to Valdez, 800 miles later. The oil flows south through the interior of Alaska to the port of Valdez in Prince William Sound, which gained worldwide attention in the late 1980s. At the time, the Reagan administration was set to open the refuge to development. It was considered a done deal. But then, disaster struck. The largest oil spill in U.S. history contaminated over 1,500 miles of pristine Alaska coastline. It was not a good time to try and open the Arctic refuge for more oil. So the idea was put on hold for a more politically opportune moment. Today, the oil is still flowing, and it can do so as long as the pipeline is healthy. 
When it was built, it was expected to last until the year 2000. The pipeline is approaching the end of its life. It's been operating since the mid-1970s, and it's probably good for another 15 or 20 years. And so there, there is some urgency that the Arctic Wildlife Refuge should be developed. From an economic point of view, the arguments in favor of developing the refuge are convincing. It will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Does that just put in so people think that it's going to do good for the economy? The industry points out that oil development in the refuge would not only create jobs, it would also increase our national security. I believe we must do everything we can to keep our dependence on foreign oil as low as possible. But others are skeptical. The fact is that this field, even if it plays out to be at the high end of what they say, there's not going to change our dependence on foreign oil. You can't pump through any one field your way to energy independence. Many energy experts feel that rampant oil development is a misguided policy for our nation and that there's a better way to both create jobs and eliminate our overseas dependence. Use energy more efficiently, bring more work out of the oil and other energy forms we already have so we get the same or better service with less cost. And by the way, that doesn't hurt the environment, it helps it. The $50 billion that America spends every year on military force dedicated to intervening in the Persian Gulf to protect our access to oil, if reinvested instead, just one year's worth, in making buildings more heat tight, would save more oil than we're importing from the Gulf. Despite these benefits, some fear the worst if the refuge cannot be tapped. To lock up Anwar's wilderness would be a, 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 a terrible disaster for this country, I think. But the refuge is not the only hope for new oil. Currently, the oil industry has access to 85% of Alaska's north coast, but they are more interested in this other 15%, the only protected stretch of America's North Slope Arctic wilderness. We've got millions and millions of acres of uh, lands that are now under lease by these large oil companies that they're not even developing. Uh, the fact is, it's like they got their plate full and they want to they want to pour some more on top of it. I mean, if we're really serious about oil development, then we should demand diligence with regards to the development of the leases they now have. But the industry has their sights set on the refuge, and if they want to get access, they need to convince people they can develop the land without making an impact. It will be done properly, responsibly. It will be done with minimal impact, and it will have no lasting effect on that area whatsoever. Can we coexist is the question. There's a couple of caribou here. Development boosters see Prudhoe Bay as a shining example of successful coexistence between industry and caribou. It shows us that they can grow and adapt to the buildings, the infrastructures, the pipeline. To put it in context, if you were to say Anwar was as big as this room, the drilling footprint would be smaller than a 3 by 5 car placed somewhere on the floor in this room. It will not destroy the wildlife refuge on that three by five car to produce that much oil. But the Department of Interior says this analogy is deceiving. If that number of acres even was correct, it's not all in one spot. You know, it's spread out like a net across the coastal plain. This net of development would hinder the free movement of the massive porcupine caribou herd of the refuge. Larger groups of caribou have a lot harder time navigating these structures than smaller groups. And we have here on the refuge probably 10 times the number of animals coming as they do at Prudhoe Bay. And we have a substantially smaller piece of real estate to deal with. Trying to guess how different sized herds will react to industrial development in two geographically distinct areas is nearly impossible. The problem in Mother Nature is you can't prove anything, you know, unless you actually conduct an experiment. Experimenting with caribou and wildlife is a risk that some people won't take. Because no one can guarantee that harm won't come to the land. If oil drilling does occur in the uh, 10 and 2 lands, how will that affect the Gwich'in people and Old Crow? Um, good question. I honestly, I don't think any of us know yet exactly what's going to happen if we do get over there with their caribou. I, we'll just have to wait and see. Impacts on wildlife may be debatable, but what is for certain is that oil development permanently transforms the fragile tundra. These scars were left by tracked vehicles from 1950s era oil exploration. It sucks. I mean, from an ecological standpoint, I mean, they're destroying the land, they're destroying everything. There are important reasons we have areas dedicated to protecting wilderness. We've made a place for oil development on the North Slope, and some would still call this wilderness. But is it really? 
Once a place is industrialized, it is no longer wild. 100 miles to the east of Prudhoe Bay lies the refuge. There really aren't too many places like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge left in the country, continent, or even world. And it's quite an opportunity to actually go and visit it. We were flown into the refuge by veteran bush pilot Don Ross. It is the most beautiful sight I think I've ever seen in my whole life. It was just gorgeous and it went on forever. It's just vast, huge open space and it just looked so cool. But it seems that beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. Other people have taken the same flight over the same land, yet seen something quite different. The coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is a dismal, flat, treeless, featureless, greenish-brown, barren, mosquito-ridden, permafrosted armpit of the universe. John McAuley, editorial commentary, Barron's Magazine. Nine months a year, it's very unattractive and cold and frozen, and that's when it's normal. The only thing looking out the window I can imagine was 150,000 caribou just wandering the coastal plain. If you hit it when the sun is shining and you see a few animals walking around, you can wax poetically about this area. But those are the exceptional times, not the normal times. It's strange how two people could be looking at the exact same thing, but see two completely different things. It's important to note that we're, we're talking about a national wildlife refuge. You know, we're not talking about a potential oil field. You know. That decision was made in 1960 when the refuge was established, and it was set aside for the nation to protect the wildlife and the wilderness values. Taking little bush plains into 19.8 million acres of wilderness was just such a unique experience. Oh, you did it. When we first landed into the Sunset Pass, it's hard to explain the emotion you felt just looking around you, looking at all the peaks of the mountains, the, the valley, the tundra. You could see the coastal plain. You could see the ice flow out in the ocean. For the next few days, we'd have no contact with the outside world, no TVs or radios, no pagers or cell phones not even the internet. There's no sign that anyone had ever been there. It was just wilderness, and that's such a great thing. Just us and the wilderness. OK, so we had a little company. You know what? There's a lot of mosquitoes there. I love the mosquitoes. Gone, gone. There were so many. I was one with the mosquito. There were swarms of mosquitoes all over the place. Like, <laughs> I think I ate about a dozen of them, and that's not counting the chili and the ravioli country chili with beans stress? and mosquitoes. Mm. Very good. Mm. There were a lot of mosquitoes. You couldn't breathe without possibly inhaling one. You hear the mosquitoes. Mm. Mm. And 17, 18, 19. <laughs> Mosquito bites. Mosquito bites. I'm going for the record. We all left a little bit of ourselves. See, you want to see my wrist? One thing I do wonder is when we're not there, what do they eat? sort of get used to the mosquitoes after a while. Sort of. Many Arctic creatures couldn't live without the mosquitoes, especially the birds. Oh yeah. And the birds, there are migratory birds in the coastal plain, and the first thing instinctively they eat are the mosquitoes. During the summers, more than 80 species of migratory birds come to the coastal plain from around the world to lay their eggs and hatch their young. Thanks to the insect bounty here on the tundra, infant birds can grow strong enough to make the migration home thousands of miles south. So they're good for the birds, but mosquitoes make life difficult for the caribou and other mammals that reside here. The caribou lose up to a liter of blood a week because the mosquitoes are so bad, so that's why another reason why the coastal plain is so important to them. The wind is wonderful because it blows away all the mosquitoes. We've seen 20, 30, 40,000 caribou march across the coastal plain and pour off the article.
solution because they're trying to get away from the bugs. That physical response to insect harassment is something that's critical in their life cycle. The coastal plain has become the critical habitat for the caribou not only to escape insects, but also for the high energy forage like cotton grass and other sedges which are plentiful here, and to escape predators like wolves and bears which live in the foothills. The coastal plain is the caribou's safe haven, their nursery, and it is important to more than just the caribou. The endangered musk oxen make their homes here year-round, and this is one of the few places in the Arctic where polar bears make their winter dens on land. Because of the abundance of plant and animal species, the coastal plain is considered the biological heart of the refuge, the center of life. We really have a world-class natural area there where it's largely an intact functioning ecosystem. The fauna and flora there are basically the biodiversity is uh, invaluable, something we cannot create again. The area has incomparable and irreplaceable scientific, ecological, historical, and educational values for the American people. The coastal plain would be irreparably altered by development. Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt. Not far over the foothills to our east lies the Canadian border. Canada established a national park to permanently protect the caribou habitat on their side of the border, and they've asked the U.S. to create the same permanent protection on our side. Thank God that uh, in the past people did set aside places like Yosemite and Yellowstone. The challenge for today's generation and for us that are making decisions today, will we have the uh, prudence and judgment to set some of these special areas aside for future generations? As we slept beneath the glare of the midnight sun, we pondered the challenges for the future. But some troubling questions remain. It seems totally ridiculous to me. We were sort of faced by hypocrisy. You guys flew all over the place. On one hand, you know, we were using oil, then on the other, we were trying to stop oil development. So were we just being hypocrites for using oil to fight oil development? Do you walk to work? Do I walk to work? And the answer is, uh, we need oil. 3.5 billion barrels is what some people believe lies below the refuge. To put it in perspective, that's the amount of oil that America burns every nine months. So is there a way to balance our voracious consumption of oil and our need to protect wilderness? If there is, it seems that politics is holding us back. When President Reagan rolled back the car and light truck efficiency standards, he essentially undiscovered what Arctic refuge is worth of oil. We ought to be going in the opposite direction. There is a whole new breed of simpler, more efficient, and cleaner cars in the making. Even in spring 98, five automakers were already in or entering mass production of 80 mile gallon cars. I mean, there's so many other alternatives we have that we haven't even explored. And the natural gas powered Civic GX. With clean and abundant natural gas, the same stuff we cook with, is already widely used for fleet vehicles and buses across the US. It's cheaper, more efficient, and just as powerful as gasoline engines. The city of Santa Monica, California uses solar power to recharge electric cars clean and unlimited energy. The same kind of speed of technological innovation that we know from consumer electronics is now coming to the car industry. Major auto manufacturers are investing heavily in research and development of super efficient hydrogen fuel cell technology, which turns water into energy. Within the next decade, we may be able to drive from coast to coast on a single tank of gas. When these cars are widely used, the savings will dwarf even the biggest Alaskan oil fields. We will be saving about 9 million barrels a day and a lot of money and a lot of pollution, and the cars will be better and probably cheaper. This would be like discovering one refuge prospect every year. And the potential for saving oil is not limited to the cars we drive. Everything we do is so illogical, it seems like. America throws away over 600,000 barrels of oil every year in the form of plastic bottles. Another good reason to recycle. Millions of barrels of oil are wasted every year thanks to inefficient technologies like incandescent light bulbs in our homes. Compact fluorescents consume a third of the energy and last up to 10 times longer. If every working American carpooled, cycled, walked, or took public transportation to work just once a month, we could save millions more barrels of oil every year. There are some big changes on the energy horizon. Through conservation and more responsible use of our resources, and through new fuels and technologies that are far superior to petroleum, the potential for our future is enormous. And we will ultimately end up in a post-petroleum era. I think it's going to come sooner than many people think, and it's just dumb business 
uh, to even think about drilling in the Arctic Refuge. Whatever you think of the environmental considerations, there are so many better, cheaper ways to do the same jobs. So were we just being hypocrites for using oil to fight oil development? In the investment world, it is common knowledge that you need to spend a little money to make money. This was our investment in protecting the refuge. No one really treads on anyone else's path. We usually make our own path beside the rest, though. We walk together, but we walk apart. Everything that people told us about this place when they compared it to Yosemite or Yellowstone was true, only it was somehow even more unique. The refuge filled us with a sensation that can be felt in so few places on our planet today, simply because there are no people here. Everything else around us is all made by man, and it's all manipulated by us, and we control it. And it's so unique to be able to be in a place where it's untouched by human hands. And with every step that we took, it was just like a different perspective on, on the scenery and on, on the wildlife out there. Still there, one last place where it's just exactly as God intended yeah. it. There's not many places left like that. Nature is the best place of all to explore your feelings and being in the middle of nowhere, hundreds of miles from any humans, you really realize that you're in God's country. Well, what do you think the future of the refuge is? My guess is at some point in the future, it will dawn on the United States Congress that oil in the Arctic Refuge is needed for domestic consumption and the coastal plain will be open to development. As long as there's a good chin standing, there will be no development here. When we set out on our journey, our goal was to investigate all sides of the issue in the hopes of discovering the truth. But instead, we discovered that each side had its own truth. So it is not a question of which side we are going to believe, but rather whose beliefs we are going to respect and support. I was still very confused until I came here to the Arctic Refuge. And you're able to explore those feelings that you can't really, you don't feel them anywhere else. You aren't able to feel them anywhere else because there's so much confusion. And there you've got solitude and you can become one with yourself and one with nature and one with God. Pretty much in the end, you just kind of have to listen to your heart. Yeah, I knew it in my heart that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge needed to be preserved from oil and gas exploration. I never want to see anything like Prudhoe Bay near here. So I believe very strongly that the Arctic Refuge will always be a tremendous natural area dedicated to wildlife and to wilderness protection. We saw only signs of caribou in the refuge. We were too late to witness one of the great wildlife spectacles in North America. If we had been there maybe a month earlier, the entire area would have been covered with over 150,000 caribou and their calves on their way south. The truth is never really known, but at least we have a much greater idea of what is going on here. Personally, I think I made a commitment to myself that I was going to come back with some kind of answer and I was going to come back and do something with it. Well, what would you have us do to carry your message? Just keep spreading the word around. You have that power and you can pass it on to other people in your university or classes. Completely closed any kind of development. To know that it exists is just as reassuring as going there. You know, a lot of people won't get to go there, but at least they, at least they can sit there and look at a picture and maybe imagine. When you get back, drop a line to the president and also the senators and let them know you guys been up here and you see this land and you support what we're doing. Dear Jana, thank you for sharing your views. 
This is from the White House, President Clinton. Every single letter I've written, I've always gotten one back. I appreciate having your pers perspective on this important issue. Sincerely, Bill Clinton. We all have a very significant role to play. We all have the power to change the vote of a congressman, or congresswoman, or even the president. A lot of things we're able to do are just phenomenal compared to a lot of other countries. Now we're convincing our congressmen that we want the wilderness areas, that we want cultures to survive. When I'm old and gray and you know, tell my grandchildren or children what I did, I want to let them know that I actually did whatever I could and put all my power into preventing the coastal plain from being drilled. I think that's really important. It might inspire them. I guess we all find our own ways to stand up for what we believe in, and we don't have to travel halfway around the world to do it. We're not here to save the planet, but to create a future we can be proud of, whatever that future may be. Thank you.